uh, some, some initial thoughts on the event this morning and, and how it's been going for you meeting the fans? It's wonderful. It really is. It's, you know, it was really interesting, the thing we did 30 years ago. Who would have believed it? Oh, know? there's lots of us out there. Don't you worry. Aaron, we're, sometimes thanks. we're in hiding, but there's lots of us oh, out there. Oh, that's great. Lots of us out there. Kieran? Yeah, it's been really good to be back here. I mean, I've seen Mike a few times around. I haven't seen Robbie for years and years. Uh, he, you know, a lot of people. Uh, and uh, John Payer and me, uh, first time after we finished uh, Dr. Sterling, this is the first time I've seen him after 30 years. Mm. So it's really good to, you know, get with the family again. Yeah. Great. <laughs> good, good. <laughs> Stephen? Well, it's been great meeting everybody here today. I can't tell you how thrilled I am to be here. I know Lisa feels the same way because, personally, I think this is well overdue. Yeah! I think so well. <laughs> Everybody I speak to or have spoken to over the last nearly 40 years, you know, when they find out they are... Oh, garlic, that, that rings a bell. That's a strange name. And, I, you know, weren't you... There was, some, there was a film, there was something... Anyway, when they find out that I did the voice of Jen in The Dark Crystal, the look of happiness <laughs> which has been replicated here today comes over them, and that's certainly been the case, you know, uh, here. So many happy memories. The film still connects with so many people after all these years. And, uh, yeah, to meet you all here today is uh, such a thrill. So thank you all very much for coming along. <laughs> Lovely. Thank you, Stephen. Thank you. Lisa? Hello. <laughs> I've had so many people come up to me today and say, I didn't know you were the voice of Kira. I thought you just did the bill and loose women. <laughs> I've been around forever. <laughs> Honestly, I'm bloody ancient. Um, yeah, I was 17 when I did the voice of Kira. Um, it was the first feature film voiceover I'd ever done. And um, I was brought in to um, audition at L Street Studios. I was doing a voiceover for a gentleman called Louis Elman, who was like the god godfather of voices, wasn't he? He used to, all the foreign films were dubbed by him and um, he really knew his stuff. So um, he came up to me one day and he said, there's this film that um, the Henson um, Muppet people are gonna be making. And they're having real trouble finding a voice for one of the characters. Can you just read this little bit of script for me? So I said, yeah, yeah, yeah. I didn't think anything about it. and just read it. Some really weird words. I didn't have a clue what it was about. And um, so that was the end of that. And then I get a phone call from my agent saying, oh, you can be doing this thing called The Dark Crystal. So long story short, rock up at Elstree. Here we are, um, 40 years later. We all look very well, don't you think? Don't oh, you think we've all aged yeah. all right? <laughs> <laughs> I look like Jen's dad, I think. Correct, that, right? yes, <laughs> correct answer. Um, and so um, I arrived in the recording studio. This is after the film has been made. And um, I turn up and there's the lovely Stephen Garlic, who was proper hot. I mean, he's still hot now, but he was really hot then. <laughs> and, um, and Jim Henson and Frank Oz. And I felt quite intimidated because when they spoke to me, I, I, Jim sounded like Kermit. A bit. <laughs> and Frank Oz sounded like Miss Piggy. Um, and and Fozzie Bear. Yeah. And, uh, and so they said, uh, Jim said, so uh, today we're going to be lip syncing. And I was like, yeah, okay. <laughs> What's that then? <laughs> um, and they taught me how to lip sync. So to actually match my voice to the puppet and follow the black cue line and know when to start speaking and when to stop speaking. So I have a lot to be grateful to them for. Uh, I think... Uh you'll all agree with me that actually Lisa is still 17. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and actually, in a way, we all are. And in a way, that's the, the great achievement of Dark Crystal, that it created a world that's timeless. And I think, in a way, that's what Jim was looking for. Mm. Of course, he was looking to say things about our current world as well, as it was then. And unfortunately, as it is increasingly now, were these big moral questions that, when, it, when Jim came up with this script, I think some of us thought this was rather simplistic, but time has proved him right, actually. These big questions of good and evil, they, they do matter. They are, they are present with us. 
And so he was able to do this in a way that makes the achievement last. It does have a timeless quality. Uh, and, and I think that what uh, Tim was saying earlier in the previous panel about the effort that he put into them, the money, the time, the thought, into making a, a real world. The, the real secret of all fantasy work is the world that is in the fringes of the picture, the world that's in the background, that's, that's behind the main characters, that the detail beyond the story that makes us feel there's a real world there. So I, I think this, this may be why we're here now, that we're the people who see Dark Crystal and it imprints itself upon us uh, at a, should we say, a deeper level. Mike, you are, you are a wonderful man. You have a wonderfully strong personality. What I'd like to know is uh, when you're maybe off camera as Augra or, or even out of costume, did you retain her sass in any way when you were kind of <laughs> waltzing around the set, kind of, you know? <laughs> my, case comes, my case comes up next week. <laughs> Thank you, Louise. <laughs> I noticed somebody hasn't changed since <laughs> I knew her many years ago. It's method acting, no, right? Method no, acting. No, yeah, it's, it's very strange. You, um, I, I had to walk, you know, with a sort of feminine wiggle the hips sort of... <laughs> Because there was a lot of padding, though I was fat then, a lot fatter than I was now. But um, there was a load of padding. Mm -hmm. And it was really awkward, really, because the only vision I had was through the one black eye. There's a, there's a normal eye and there's like a gauzy eye, and that's the only one I could see through. So all that movement around in the observatory and things like that was very hard and very... And uh, I spent a lot of time you know, with the guys who operated the machine, mm. going through how I could walk normally through there with the things just missing my head. And, you know, like I've done it hundreds and hundreds <laughs> of times, natural. And so what we used to do, I used to go in there at lunchtime and get the guy to put the machine on a bit slow, and then I'll make it a bit faster and a bit faster. And it really worked out well. But, but uh, yeah, I only wish that... Um, uh, Augur, no, you know, could have a leotard or something like that. You know, something, you know, <laughs> I bit, don't think anyone wants to see yeah, that. Yeah, one. Right, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Kieran, um, being live action uh, Jen and, and the other characters, Chamberlain, etc., um, watching the film again, of course, in preparation for this week, um, lots of precarious, like dangerous positions they, they kind of seem to put you in, like teetering along a hillside or leaping over onto the crystal. Um, you know, how difficult was that? And, and any kind of near misses of any kind? Or I mean, I can remember when I trained in the observatory, Ogras observatory, right? I need to climb up that moving planets and stuff like that. Yeah. And then he had to jump off and through the window and then sliding down. Because that was done in pits. Go did the jump up and went up and climbed off that or jumped off that onto the balcony. Mm. And then the window thing was done separately. And seeing me coming through the window, go that was fine. And then a uh, few weeks after they went, okay, right, we are doing the another part of that. And that now, just remember that you just come out of the window and you're straight on the hill and you're tumbling all over the place. No, look at that fine, that'll be great. And the first take I did, and I didn't give myself enough poofs. Oh. So I went about a quarter of the way through. It just kind of and I stopped, and I went, <laughs> okay, I've got to get up very quickly and fall back again. Yeah. And go carry it on. And from there I learned, okay, we need to do, you know, push more. And didn't realize that I was going to end up doing 25 takes. Because the whole idea was, Jim with Jane Puppet was hiding behind the booth. Yeah. As soon as I landed behind the bus, Jen would come up. Yeah. And sometimes we got the timing wrong of coming up and stuff like that. It went on like that. Then we had a camera technical fall a couple of times. Then went into 25 takes of me just rolling down. <laughs> so that was a really hard one. Uh, there were other stunts for Jim climbing, uh, Jen climbing the wall, uh, the waterfall. That was for real. Uh, we went to Yorkshire in Leeds, yeah. and outside Leeds they found this little waterfall and all this stuff. And I had to, uh, with the people 
who used to walk the, who used to, well, very used to climbing that waterfall, had to teach me a certain way to put my footing everywhere. And one of them was behind me off camera. If anything went, he was going to try and catch me. If I yeah, and go, did that, that was a really good one. And then we came back and I did the scientist. Uh, I fall into the, into the crystal or yeah. into the pit. Go, yeah, it was really good fun, but I had to really <laughs> grind for it. And just before that, I started doing stunts and moving. Because it was like, okay, yeah, this is going to get me somewhere else again. Okay, that was good. How did, how did you find the stilts of the Baby Land Strider? Uh, Robbie was, training you, yeah, of course. Yeah, Robbie was training me. Yeah. Uh, first time he put me on the stilts, and he walked in front of me, walking backwards. Don't worry, Kieran, if you fall, I'll catch you. And I went, <laughs> we are right. <laughs> but that was really that's, good fun. That's trust, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, trust with a clown. <laughs> a clown can go, oops, sorry, missed you. <laughs> Yeah, but they were really you, good fun. You were full size before that, weren't you? Yeah, yes. exactly. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, no, but it was really good. It was really good and taught me really well. Did you find that it still stretched even you, that, performing these creatures? Well, yes. I mean, it's very interesting. I mean, as you mentioned, you know, I was in circus. Mm. And I actually, when I saw the advert, it appeared in the stage, you know, the, the, the paper of the theatre. A box advert one day saying performers uh, needed with background in uh, theater, mime, ballet, dance, and circus. And somebody showed it to me, and I wasn't going to do it actually because I, I, I felt that I, I don't like the way in which other art forms steal from circus. And I thought I won't do it. But the last minute, I decided to, to do it, to apply. And we had to, actually, it was a difficult process because they, they auditioned us for 10 days consecutively before they chose who they would take into the main team. But it, they really were committed to what Brian said earlier, uh, um, the using, respecting different disciplines mm. and, and bringing us together to find a new way in which we could use our skills. Mm. And so, you know, in circus, it, a lot of it is about height and achievements and, uh, and, and what targets you can, can, can hit. But in the film, it was about whether you can make these things appear to be alive. Mm. And that's a real challenge. You have to do that in circus clowning too. But to do that in a costume, it was the struggle to bring character into these things. What Brian spoke earlier about, to make them express emotion and life. And that was... That was a real challenge. And that's why we were given, you know, eight months, 12 months to rehearse these creatures. Yeah. And that's why Amiel was brought in to do it. And that, as Tim was saying earlier, you don't get that on many films. No. This was what was extraordinary. Yeah. So it wasn't the physical difficulty. We could train to do that. Mm. That was really hard. But it, finding the art way, of bringing yeah. it through. Yeah, yeah, yeah absolutely. Um, we had about 10 minutes. Yeah. Get in the studio, Lisa. <laughs> so what were your fresh initial reactions to the film? Because even, obviously, especially in 1982, very fantastical, very out there. What, what was it like to see this? Uh, well, where's Miss Piggy and Kermit? They're, not, they're nowhere to be seen. <laughs> this is Jim Henson we're talking about here. <laughs> no, obviously, you know, it, we could see straight away that Jim and Frank and the other members of the team were looking not to distance themselves from the Muppets because they, they, they were huge back then, weren't they, as they still are today. But they just wanted to do something different, yeah. you know, more fantastic. And uh, they were pioneers back then. When you, I mean, we were um, amazingly impressed with the, with the puppetry and, and, and all that, that went with it, you know, the mechanics of, of the whole film. And um, we just thought this was just so ahead of its time, you know, no one else, else had done anything like this. We'd not seen anything like this. Uh, so I think when I came into it, I was obviously very impressed to see what had been already achieved. And, uh, but we had the easy job, you know, we didn't have any of the physicality. Well, having said that, I did battle with a little bit of, um, uh, what's, what is it when you 
and you keep on um, like hyperventilating. hyperventilating. Because if you look at the film, there's a lot of panting that Jen does in there, you know, because he's, he's always running, isn't he? So every five minutes or so, I think we would stop and We did and a lot of running together because we, we did our voices at the same time, didn't we? Not like a, a lot of films now. You'll put someone in a booth on their own and they'll be in a different country. But we did actually work together. So I remember us doing joint running things. And I just thought, if somebody just heard this tape in isolation, <laughs> this, would, this would sound really, really weird. Um, but they didn't. Thank goodness. We should have asked you how to do running like the wind. Run like the wind. Yes, running like the wind. <laughs> it's really weird. When you were talking about the Landstrider then, it's a strange thing because the puppet was so good. The puppets, the Gelfling puppets particularly, I felt had such real life in them. Um, I sort of feel like I played Kira. Is that, I know it was just the voice, but I've, I've sort of... I, I feel like she was like a real person. And when you were talking about the Landstrider, I nearly said, oh, that's when I was on top of you. <laughs> when I was <laughs> Genuinely, I, I know that sounds weird. Um, in the wrong way. And I don't mean it to... Sounds quite so, nice. <laughs> but I just... I, she was such a... She had so much life in her. When I had to do the voice, I, I knew as soon as I saw the action, exactly what to do. Exactly how, how to, to breathe, what, what noises to make, because there was so much life in the puppet already, which is extraordinary, really, when well, you, yeah. you know... And you're having to live their moments. You, you know, just a voice performance, yes, it, it, you know, you are embodying them. You're still having to take on their actions and character, just like you're saying. So, yeah, absolutely, that bond must still form. Absolutely. And I'm so proud of the fact that, sorry, I've got to be girls. Right. <laughs> just, I'll just um, wait. Of course, of course you should. You're a boy. Um, yeah. <laughs> we'll get to that. No we'll wings. get to that. <laughs> <laughs> wings. He has no wings. He's got an issue about not having any wings. Can we get him some wings? Um, I've got what I was going to say now. Um, <laughs> Yes, you do embody the character, and I'm really, I really... What I was about to say is, she was ahead of her time, I feel, because she was very much girl power before we even knew what girl power was. Um, yeah, she was awesome. So you've led us beautifully to that. We actually have a personal request from Zay that you, perhaps, the pair of you, give us the uh, famous wings scene, as it were, if you can remember your lines at all, or perhaps just the moment when they do fall off the cliff and it's revealed. <laughs> We were dream fasting. Is that right? Is that one of that? That's not in that scene. That's close. That's close. Um, do I need to get a little higher? Uh, maybe a little higher, yeah. Okay. <laughs> I thought I was. Wings? Gelfling don't have wings. Is that right? Yeah. No, you don't have yeah. wings. I don't have wings. <laughs> I don't have wings. <laughs> Of course boy. not. Because you're a boy. You're a boy. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> and I remember um, the things like the word, the dialogue I remember the most is when Jim and Frank said to us on the day, as they often said, "Can you just make up some sounds and some words?" <laughs> and like and I remember for this Landstrider scene, I I had to sort of go make funny noises as I was kind of commanding you to, to move. Um, and and I, I'd just come back from holiday in Spain. And I, so I decided to sort of, sort of do a Spanish <laughs> accent. <laughs> Una Paloma Blanca. Could have, yeah. No, it was... And so I, and I remember making up the word. I said the word, dole, dole, stan ye tembar, dole. Yeah. And it was sort of a Spanish thing that I did. And, and they went, oh, that's really nice. We, can we keep that in? And now in the uh, Netflix series, they have like a whole dictionary, apparently, of the yeah. language. <laughs> And my dole dole is Daniel yeah. Tamar's in the Blooming Dictionary. <laughs> uh, so, Stephen, obviously, uh, boys are special too. <laughs> um, if you could give a unique ability to male gelflings, what would it be? I don't know. There was a physicality about Jen, wasn't there, really? Yeah. You know, uh, I think that. I'd as was obviously portrayed yeah. by my friend here, you know. <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. But, uh, no, I, I think with, with, with Jen, he was, he was a listener, wasn't he? He did a lot of listening in the film, yeah. especially to the master at the beginning, mm -hmm. you know, and don't leave me when he died. Wasn't that sad, that bit at the beginning when he died? Yeah. Yeah. You know, and um, one of the things I will say about bringing that physicality and that, the character of Jen to life was that we had a lot of help from Jim and Frank. You know, 
because you have, to, you have to remember that they were very good actors in their own right, when you think about it. When you think of all the Muppet characters that they brought to life uh, and, and the portrayal that they, they, they did, you know, they, they were behind us and corrected us on a few things, didn't they? Yeah. They never felt critical, did they, ever? They, they, I mean, both really charismatic men, um, particularly Jim. He was so gentle. Um, and we were kids, weren't we? I mean, uh, and, you know, never, never done anything like the lip-syncing thing before. But they actually managed to get us to dub the film, like, three times through in its entirety, with different accents. Um, Jim had that sort of gentleness about him. If ever you see interviews... Uh, on YouTube or wherever of Jim Henson. He always comes across as very, very, very gentle. And that character about him came across when we were in the studios doing the, the voice recording. You know, he, he was great and he helped us tremendously. Uh, obviously, we had to um, Americanize the delivery, didn't we? Yeah, you struggled with that, do you remember? I did, yeah. Well, no, <laughs> certain, certain words, you know, if they weren't quite right, he would correct us on yeah. phonetics, wouldn't he? Yeah, and definitely. Things so, like that. So we were really English at first, and then we were really American. And then they said... Um, they, Jim and Frank kept saying they don't like it to be too... I don't know who they were talking about, because I always felt that Jim and Frank were in charge, but um, they said, yeah, they, they, they don't like it when you're too uh, English, so we're going to... Um, so we're going to do this whole thing uh, with an American, a, a pure American accent. Uh, and then they said, well, they don't like it too American. I'm thinking, who are, they, who are these people? Um, and then he said, we're going to do it in a sort of, his words were, a sort of disc jockey's voice. <laughs> a sort of mid-Atlantic, which is what it, it was in the end. Maybe we ought to do that part of the script. Hi, I'm Hi. Jen. Yeah. Welcome. <laughs> yeah. Sensational. Hey, this is great. Great to meet you, Kira. Great hey, to meet I, you too. Wings. Yeah. yeah, I'm doing this for charity, Jen. <laughs> <laughs> Lovely. Thank you very much. Well, um, this panel, this Q&A has absolutely been sensational. Uh, thank you very much. Again, a nice warm round of applause. Robbie Barnett, Lisa Maxwell, yeah. Stephen Garlick, Kieran Shaw, Mike Edmonds. Thank you very, very much. Um, <laughs>